Starship completes its sixth test flight. Webb analyzes a star in another galaxy and then confirms the Hubble tension again and a new explanation for the moons of Mars. All this and more in this week's Space Bites. This week, we saw the sixth test flight of the SpaceX Starship and Super Heavy combo. And the goal once again was to just run through pretty much the exact same flight path that we saw for the fifth flight. They launched Super Heavy and Starship and everything went fine as the rocket lifted off the launch pad and then separated nicely with Super Heavy doing its boost back burn while Starship continued on to orbit. The hope was to do another capture of the Super Heavy booster at the launch site on Mechazilla. As Super Heavy was doing its boost back burn, they communicated back to the tower to make sure that everything was fine for a landing and called it off and diverted the spacecraft to the ocean just off the coast of Boca Chica. Now we learned after the fact that it looks like there was an antenna on the tower that got bent during the launch and that was what was needed to coordinate the return back to the launch pad. And so the rocket returned did a soft landing just off of the coast of Boca Chica. And it looked great and then fell over and exploded as they do. What was also cool was the launch was visible from orbit seen by the International Space Station. Onboard Starship was a zero gravity indicator, a banana that they had put in the middle of the giant fairing cargo area. Although we didn't really see a lot of the banana. I mean, we saw it, it was just sort of sitting there. I guess it was it was like had wires or something. I don't know what they'd done to that banana. One of the big additional tests that they were planning to do for this mission was could they relight one of the Raptor engines? And this is important because when you go into orbit, you want to be able to decide when the spacecraft is going to return to Earth. You got to be able to relight your engines while you're in space to then do your reentry burn. So they're able to just turn on the engine for just a moment, demonstrate that they can turn on the Raptors in space, and then Starship continued its ballistic trajectory and then came down again in the Indian Ocean. What was great this time was it happened during the day. And so we were actually able to see the various cloud decks watch as the spacecraft was getting closer and closer to the surface of the Earth. And then we saw it flip around and do its landing. And of course, once again, they knew where it was going to land. And so they were able to switch to the buoy cam and actually watch as the spacecraft made its descent down, hovered just above the ocean and then fell over and also exploded. And so I think, you know, this mission would have been a complete success if they had caught the booster back at Mechazilla. So in this case, hopefully the next one will be more successful. Now, with the future, the next really big milestone is for SpaceX to demonstrate that Starship can come back from orbit, do its reentry burn and be able to be captured by Mechazilla as well. And so it's expected that we'll see that test attempted sometime in early 2025. But we're going to see probably more and more tests. The cadence is going to pick up as they continue to test this out. And of course, that's because they are on the critical path for the Artemis 3 mission. They've got to supply the human land system that's going to be able to take the astronauts from lunar orbit down to the surface of the moon and back up again. They need to demonstrate being able to capture and refuel Super Heavy and Starship, be able to demonstrate transferring propellant in space and demonstrate that they can fly out to the moon. So there's a lot of things still yet to do, but it's great to see the rapid cadence of test flights. A detailed image of a star in another galaxy. So you're looking at a picture of one of the largest known stars. This is WOH G64, and it is a red supergiant star at the very end of its life. It's about 2000 times larger than the sun. And what makes this picture amazing is that this star is located in another galaxy. It's located in the Large Magellanic Cloud. That's the same galaxy where we saw Supernova 1987A. So it's about 170 thousand light years away. The picture was taken with the very large telescope interferometer. And this is where you have four separate telescopes that are separated that are able to work as a single telescope that is the size of the separation of the telescopes. And Although it's hard to see in the image that you're looking at, what you've got is the central star and then it's surrounded by this ring of 
gas and dust that has been thrown off by the star as it goes through the final stages of its life. And even over the course of about 10 years, astronomers have seen a dramatic change in the composition of this ring of material around the star. And it will absolutely go supernova at some point, but that process can take thousands of years. So it could go supernova tomorrow, or it could go supernova in 100,000 years. We kind of don't know. Same thing as Betelgeuse, right? Although it's hard to make out in this image, here's an artist's representation of what it would see if we could actually get close and see this star. Webb confirms the Hubble tension again. How fast is the universe expanding? Astronomers have done many observations over the decades and come to a number that is roughly 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec. Over the last few years, better telescopes have come out, better measurements have been taken, and astronomers have narrowed down that measurement. On the one hand, you have measurements made from objects that are relatively close to us, Cepheid variables, we have them here in the galaxy, we can see them in other galaxies, and they provide a really good way to measure the expansion rate of the universe. On the other end, you have the cosmic microwave background radiation, essentially the first light in the universe. And that has been measured with tremendous accuracy by ESA's Planck mission. And the problem is, is that what was seen in the cosmic microwave background and what's been seen in the Cepheid variables don't match. They're not the same number. Now, for the longest time, you had these error bars that overlapped. And so astronomers always assumed that it would be some number in between. But now, with better measurements, the error bars have disappeared. And up until now, the best measurements had been done by the Hubble Space Telescope. And then James Webb comes along and is able to double check the measurements made by the Hubble Space Telescope. Last year, James Webb was used to double check the distance measurements to the Cepheid variables. These are these incredibly variable stars that pulsate. And that's what Hubble used to measure the Hubble constant originally back 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah, the, the guy not the telescope. And so after Webb had done the follow on measurements that had been made by the Hubble Space Telescope on the Cepheid variables and confirmed that yes, indeed, they are very accurate. They then moved on to the next distance measurement that astronomers rely on. And those are type 1a supernovae. You get a type 1a supernovae when a white dwarf star is accumulating material from a binary companion, and the star reaches this very precise number 1.4 times the mass of the sun, when it reaches that limit, it explodes as a supernova. And because there's a known amount of material that formed the supernova, when you see that supernova, and you see how bright it is, then you know how intrinsically bright it should be. And that allows you to measure the distance when the supernova went off. Up until now, the most accurate measurements of type 1a supernovae were done with the Hubble Space Telescope. And so once again, astronomers came through and used James Webb to double check the distances to type 1a supernova. And what do you know, they also confirmed that they are incredibly accurate. And so the Hubble tension just won't go away. Now, if you're interested in this process of measuring distance in the universe, I've got a fascinating interview with Adam Reese. He won the Nobel Prize being one of the people that helped confirm the existence of dark energy. But really, he is the best in the business at measuring the distances to objects out in space. So we've got a fantastic interview, really one of my favorites here on the channel, where we talk all about the methodologies of using James Webb to measure the distances to distant objects. Three more galactic monsters found by Webb. More Webb news. One of the most interesting discoveries made by Webb is that the galaxies in the early universe seem to be a lot larger and more evolved than astronomers ever expected, more evolved than what would be predicted by the existing theories of cosmology. And so astronomers have been arguing about how you could get galaxies that are this big this early. Recently, astronomers put out a theory that in fact, you're not seeing these large, very evolved galaxies, you're actually seeing an optical illusion caused by the supermassive black hole at the heart of the galaxy, essentially pushing up its numbers. And now recently, astronomers found three more of these monster galaxies, thanks to Webb. And these galaxies appear to have about the same amount of mass as the Milky Way. But what makes them interesting is that they probably have twice the efficiency of star formation than other galaxies seen later on in the universe. And this might be the key that in fact, 
the reason you could get galaxies that are so big so early is not that there's some other way that material is coming together. But in fact, it's the efficiency that star forming happens early on in the universe that could lead you to more evolved galaxies, more stars, and giving you that more evolved view of the early universe. Of course, we're still just in the early days of this process It's another one of these unfolding mysteries. And so I'm sure within a couple of weeks, I will be giving some completely different news that tries to build upon that. So stay tuned. If you want to learn more about how astronomers are finding these impossible galaxies, here's another interview that I did. It's a little older, but the and so everything has changed. But the sort of underlying science of it, I think is still really important and interesting. Every week, we do a vote on our channel where you tell us what you thought was the most important space news of the week. And the winner this week was that the ozone hole is shrinking. So thank you everybody who voted here on the channel. Now we post a new poll within about 24 hours of when we post Space Bites every week. We put it on the community tab, but if you're just scrolling on YouTube, it should show up in your feed. Of course, the best chance is go to the community tab, find the poll, vote for a bunch of them, and then you will have trained the YouTube algorithm that you want to see more of these polls. Of course, you should also subscribe to the channel, click on the notifications bell, do everything to obey the algorithm. Stars are eating their planets. Astronomers have some amazing tools these days to measure the composition of various stars. And something really interesting has been happening. They've been finding that a lot of stars have metals polluting their upper atmospheres. Now, of course, when astronomers say metal, they're talking about anything that is heavier than helium is considered to be metal. And so they, they're seeing the presence of carbon and nitrogen and oxygen and and other things you might consider to be metal like iron in the upper atmospheres of these stars. But what's really interesting is you can have two stars that formed in the same nebulae, they are very close to each other in space and should have very similar chemical compositions. And they do, except you could have one that has a lot of metal polluting its atmosphere and one that doesn't. So what's going on? The answer seems to be that the stars with metal polluting their atmospheres ate their planets. So there's this classification of exoplanets known as ultra short period exoplanets. And these can go around their star sometimes in just a few hours, they're very close. And yet only 0.5% of exoplanetary systems contain these ultra short period planets, where do they go? So a new paper suggests that in fact, three to 30% of stars had these ultra short period planets orbiting around them, and then gobbled them up. And that explains why we don't see a lot of the ultra short period planets, and also why random stars appear to be polluted by metals. They ate their planets. How did Mars get its moons? Mars has two asteroid like moons, Phobos and Deimos. And astronomers have been puzzled over how Mars got these moons. There's two main theories. The one theory is that they are captured asteroids, and they really look like asteroids. And that makes sense that they could have been captured out of the asteroid belt, which is relatively close to Mars. The other possibility is more like how the Earth got its moon. When a very large object crashed into the Earth, the debris was sent out into space and part of that collected into the moon that we see today. It's possible that a large asteroid crashed into Mars threw up debris and that debris turned into the moons Phobos and Deimos. But a new paper came out that suggests a new way. And that is that a large asteroid came too close to Mars came within the Roche limit of Mars, the intense tidal forces from Mars tore the asteroid apart into a whole bunch of debris that debris then went on chaotic orbits around Mars, some of it flung off into space, some of it went into orbit around Mars, and some of it crashed and collided with each other. Also, there would be a whole bunch of debris of dust that was grinding together. And eventually the material collected into the two moons that we see today, Phobos and Deimos. And the researchers were able to run supercomputer simulations, trying different trajectories of large asteroids coming close to Mars until they got a situation that matched the existence of Phobos and Deimos. And so we can add a third explanation for how Mars got its moons. And really, we're all going to be looking forward to the upcoming Japanese mission to Phobos, which is going to put a lander, bring a sample back. And that should finally give us an answer 
for how Mars got its moons. Repurposing one of Mars Express's cameras. When the European Space Agency's Mars Express orbiter arrived at Mars, it was carrying a secondary lander called Beagle 2. Like, do you remember this? And so the spacecraft detached the Beagle 2 lander. Beagle 2 entered the atmosphere and it was never heard from again. Later on, observations from the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter finally found the crashed location of the Beagle 2 lander. And on board Mars Express was a camera called the Visual Monitoring Camera and had one job which was to confirm that Beagle 2 had been properly deployed in space. And so once the visual monitoring camera had done its job, they switched it off. And then in 2007, they switched the camera back on and scientists proposed that this camera could actually be a scientific instrument on board the spacecraft. And so what it, ha it has a 30 by 40 degree view of Mars is able to see a full disk of Mars from its perspective. And so astronomers have used the visual monitoring camera to take whole Mars pictures watching as storm systems evolve on the surface of Mars. So we've got a really interesting article on universe today about how the scientists propose to repurpose this camera to serve this second job as a science instrument. Yeah, while you're watching this week's episode of Space Bites, I am writing my weekly email newsletter, The Guide to Space. And this we cover many more stories than we have time to talk about here in Space Bites. For example, Uranus is getting colder and now we know why. Main sequence and white dwarf binaries are hiding in plain sight. And a new Mars landing approach. How will land large payloads on Mars? If you want to get those additional space news stories, subscribe to my newsletter, go to universe today.com slash newsletter to sign up. It's completely free. I write every word and there are no ads. I'm going to talk about some changes we're making to our video publishing schedule. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Adam Schaefer, Andrew Gross, Barry Lake Roofing, David Gilton, and David Matz, Dennis Alberti, Dustin Cable, James Clark, Jeremy Mattern, Jim Burke, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Paul Rohrbach, scienceworldrecord.org, spiderswap.io, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Fowler Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other supporters on Patreon. So you've probably noticed a bunch of additional things that we've been doing here on the channel. And I just want to sort of explain everything that's going on. So the first thing is that we've decided to double the number of question shows that we release every week, but they are half the length. So before the question shows were about 45 minutes long. Now they're going to be about 22 minutes long. And this is sort of a couple of reasons. I've had a lot of people tell me that the question shows are just too long and they want something that's more snackable, more space bites length. And so, okay, now you have twice as many episodes, half as long. So I think that's going to work really well. And the second thing is that I've always wanted to give my audience you a chance to ask questions of the people who I'm going to be talking to I sort of feel like I'm your best shot at being able to find out this information about the universe. And so recently, we have been asking the Patreon community to give us any questions for the upcoming guests that I have scheduled. Now you don't have to be a paid patron member, you just have to be a member a free member or a patron member. So it's free to join. And so I'm making an announcement of upcoming interviews and asking for you to give me questions. And so when it comes up in the interview, I will try to ask some of your questions of the guests. And then also, there's a lot of additional conversation that I have that we sometimes just cut out. And you know, because we're having a segue or we're just chatting about something that isn't directly related, but it sort of sucks to cut that stuff away. So we've decided we're just going to package that up and also make that available over on Patreon. Again, it's completely free. So if you just go to patreon.com slash universe today, and then you can follow us for free, and then you'll get announcements of all of this material that we do. And you can participate in asking the questions of the guests, as well as seeing all the additional bonus material. So I hope you enjoy that. I look forward to your questions so that I can pass them along to my guests. All right, we'll see you next week.